Amen. I'm just going to start. Let's just let's just go right into the reading. If we could go to Luke chapter 23, verses 26 through 47. If you're if you have no idea who Jesus is, buckle up because you're about to do you're about to see a superhero do the unimaginable. Luke 23 verse 26 says, let me see where I, here we are. Verse 26, as they led Jesus away, a man named Simon who was from Cyrene happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the son of God the son of our creator, who came down to planet earth, lived a life that you and I could never live. He lived sinless, never lied, can you imagine? Never stole, never cheated, never lusted. Paid his taxes, he did did all of the things. He did all of the things, and here he is. I mean, he's healing the sick, he's casting out devils, he's raising the dead, he's preaching the good news everywhere he goes. And in this moment is the, is the crescendo of his life, the climax, that he would lay down his life to the people that he came to save. He would allow the very people that he came to save from their sin, which is you and me, to murder him, to crucify him, to put nails in his wrists and nails in his feet and allow him to die. This is where we're at right now. The son of God, God in the flesh, coming down to planet Earth, we are watching his final moments of life in this text. A large crowd trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us and plead with the hills, bury us. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? We could talk about that for a long time, but we'll, I'll let you deal with that with the Holy Spirit this week. That's there's so much to that, though. Two, two others, check this out, both criminals were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. What's the crucifixion? It's, it is the most painful torture device you could ever imagine. A piece of wood vertically, a piece of wood horizontally. Literally, you're nailed to this thing. And the way that you die when you're hanging on this cross is through suffocation. Because you're in this position where you can't comfortably even get a breath for hours. Like sometimes the crucifixion would last for days before someone would die. And here you have Jesus in the middle who did nothing wrong. And he's got a criminal to his right and to his left. Verse 34, Jesus said, Father, check this out. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. This is the heart of God in the midst of his son's suffering. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. I want you to just, like, I want you to get the picture of the price that's being paid right now. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. Can you imagine? This guy's literally dying next to him. And what's coming out of him is mocking the Savior in between the two criminals. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Can I pause right there real quick? Just as a side note. Here's what's amazing about the good news. 
Sometimes I think like, how do we, how do we present the, the gospel, the message of Jesus in a way that's palatable to everybody? Can I give you a newsflash? It will be the stench of death to some and the aroma of life to others. Sometimes I think we, we, we try too hard to figure out, okay, how do I package this in a way that everyone's going to receive? And the reality is, is that the foolishness of the cross, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But it is the power of God unto salvation for some. Faithfully preach this message. You see right here one man mocking the Savior in between. And you have another man who's catching a revelation in this moment. This guy didn't do anything wrong. What does he say? Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus reply? Did Jesus say, well, you didn't go to essentials class. Oh, you missed baptism. We've been trying to get you to sign up to do baptism for 10 years and you didn't get baptized. Did you, did you do the self-fed reading? Did you, submit, did you submit your video to TMAC? Did you do the self-fed reading? Self-fed 365? No, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. This is the good news. This is the good news. That there's no amount of toil and work that you and I can do to receive forgiveness for our sins. It is a free gift. It is a gift of grace. And in this moment, this sinner on a cross says, well, can I come in? And Jesus says, yes, there's a seat for you at the table. Today, you will dine with me in paradise. We'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the message, but I want you to hold on to that. If you feel like, man, you feel like you had to come in with a hoodie on because if people knew that you were here in church today or somehow if God saw you, like you're gonna hide from God, that a lightning bolt would strike, you are in the right place. You are in the right place today. Watch this. this, this, this here's the kicker. Here's, here's the point I really wanna hit. By this time, it was about noon and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone. And suddenly, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. And then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Let me tell you something. Nobody took Jesus' life from him. He laid down his own life. And he made the decision, I'm going to make this sacrifice for my people. That is the sovereignty and the power of our almighty God, King Jesus. And with those last words, he breathed his last. And when the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshiped God and said, surely this man was innocent. I want to ask you a question. Is there any challenge in your life that you are trying to work through that you feel like you don't have what it takes for? Anybody? Yeah. You can write it down, just like, let this be a moment between you and the Holy Spirit. Is there any moment in, or any challenge in your life that you feel like you don't have what it takes for? I'll give you a challenge. Epley Airport. That's one of my challenges. I love, and if you're watching online, you're like, where the heck's that? That's the, really the only airport in Omaha. And what's amazing, I love this city, by the way. I know in the past I've like kind of thrown shade on the corn huskers and things like that, being a a Miami hurricane myself, but I think I might actually like Nebraska more than Miami, if I'm completely honest. Like, this is my home now. Yeah, yeah, I said it, I said it. Yeah, I said it. I love this city. I really, I really, I love the people here. I love the culture here. I love the pace here. I just love this place. But Epley Airport, my goodness, like... You'd think like being smack dab in the middle of the country, you'd have a few more flight options. Like, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm just observable phenomenon here. Like, if we're in the middle of the country, like, couldn't we get a direct flight pretty much anywhere else? Like, I have a flight, I have a flight coming up to Fort Lauderdale. I guess we're, we're stopping in Denver. Like, why are you going west just to go east? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. So like uh, this year, I've been traveling a lot more for work than I have in the past. And it's like, it's always an opportunity just to give sacrificial thanks for for where God's placed me. And and, uh, one of the things, I mean, obviously, like when when you live in Omaha, you get very familiar with layovers, like trying 
trying to find a place that is not too long of a layover. Maybe you can get a good bite to eat. And uh, I, I was, I, I can't remember what, what city I was stopped in, but I was at this, I was in a layover and I was like, I, I didn't have a ton of time before my flight. And I was like trying to figure out where I could go eat for food. And I go to my gate, you know, you just go to your gate to make sure that you know where it is. So I go to my gate and then I just see this thing next to the gate called the Capital One Lounge. And I was like, what on earth is this? And so I go up and I was like, what, what is this? And there's like people going up this escalator and I'm like, what? I've never seen such a thing. And they said, well, if you're a Capital One Venture Card holder, you have access to this lounge. And I was like, like looking for my wallet and I like, like, I have one of those. So what is, how does this work? And like all these people are just like super cool. Like they're chilling in the lounge. They're like, rookie. Like I've, I'm just like, so how does this work? They're like, well, you know, the, like let's make sure it's legit. But Okay, you're, you're next in line. And I was like, next in line? Next in line for what? And so I go sit down and I'm just like, this is, this is very, anticipation's building up. And then the lady comes out and she's like, sir, are you Mr. Chatfield? Yes. Well, you're, you're next in line. Okay. So I go up on this elevator and I go up into this lounge and then they open the doors and it's like, it's like a spa in the middle of an airport. Some of you are laughing because you're like, bro, you just figured this out. I've been like, I've been doing this forever. I was like, dude, all like I was eating where all the peasants were eating, like, you know, the Chick-fil-A and all that's no, no shade on Chick-fil-A. But I was like a commoner for so long. And then here I am. I just get, I just get elevated into this, this place where there's a buffet of food and they're like, do you want to take a shower? I'm like, a shower? <laughs> you could take a shower at the airport? They have a coffee bar. They got, they got a bar bar, but we don't do that because we're Christians, right? But they got a coffee bar. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, how long did this exist before I found out about it? And all, like, all, I had the key to access this thing for years, for years. You see, it was never Capital One's fault that I never went. You see, they don't just like send like a horse, a guy on a horse to like, doo -doo 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 -doo. hey, Cap, Mr. Chatfield, you've had a card in your wallet for the longest time that you're not leveraging. Come on, get on the horse. We'll take you to the lounge. That's not how it works. This thing has existed, but because of my ignorance, I wasn't accessing something that was readily available to me all this time. And so you better believe I got in line again and again and again. And I put all like as many meatballs on that plate as you could possibly imagine. It's still free. Is it free again? Yes, it's still free. Really? Yes. Unlimited supply, baby. The title of this message is Unlimited Supply. Some of you are hooting and hollering because you're catching the spiritual principle behind this. And I think there's, if I'm completely honest, and I, I can say this because I've lived a lot of my Christian life this way, there are so many Christians who are white knuckling through life. And let me tell you this, let me tell you, <laughs> you love God. You love God. You love his word, you love what he did for you, but for whatever reason, when you hear the scripture say, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When you hear that, you're just like, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I'm missing this. This part doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I'm not saying that we don't have, I don't, I'm not saying we don't have trial through life, I'm not saying we don't have tribulation, but there is an anointing there's an access that God gives us that no matter what season I'm walking through, I can bear fruit. That my leaf will not wither and I shall succeed in everything that I do. That's what it says in Psalm chapter one. By the anointing of the Holy Spirit, there's a frictionlessness. There's a flow. There's an access to treasures in heaven that makes this life not just something to survive through, but to enjoy, that there's fruit coming out of your life that's not just for your own enjoyment, but for other people's enjoyment too. This is the secret. The secret 
is accessing the presence of God. And all of this happens. All of this is made readily available to you and me through what we just, what we just saw. That when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the temple curtain, I want you to take that in your Bible, please. Circle it, underline it. The temple curtain was torn in two. Because we can just gloss over that and not understand the weight of what's happening there. But to understand, let me take you back a few thousand years. So earlier in the Bible, there's this, this day, this holiday that God consecrated called the Day of Atonement. And what's the Day of Atonement? The Day of Atonement was a once-in-a-year event where a man who was the high priest on behalf of all of Israel was allowed to access what was behind this curtain in the temple. Because let me tell you, what's behind that curtain is the answer to every problem that you and I face in life. What's behind that curtain is the answer to every challenge. What's behind that curtain is the presence of God. Did you know that one of the names of God is El Shaddai? What's El Shaddai? I want you to write this down in your notes. El Shaddai means the all-sufficient one. It means he needs nothing from nobody. In and of himself, all things flow, and there's more than enough with him. And this God is hidden behind this curtain. Why? Because he hates people? No, because the presence of God, God is not just good and kind and fuzzy and cozy. God is holy. And when people like you and me, the Bible says, Romans 3.23, that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In our sinful condition, God can have no part with us. His holiness would literally burn us up. We wouldn't exist anymore. And so in order for this person, the high priest, to go back behind this curtain, there was, there was like this insane, go back and read it in Leviticus, an insane amount of ceremonial cleansing that needed to happen. Multiple sacrifices, things like a scapegoat being led off into the wilderness, taking the blood of these sacrifices and sprinkling them all over the temple like covering the entire temple with the blood. He had to change his clothes multiple times, wash himself perfectly. And here's the key. Here's what's so wild. If he messed up anything, he would die. Ancient Jewish tradition says that on on the robe, on the the hem of his garment were bells. And they would say that the, the tradition would go that if the bells were so important because when you heard the high priest's bells jingling when he went behind the curtain, you knew that he was alive in the presence of God. But as soon as you stopped hearing the bells, something catastrophic might have happened. What's amazing is this same presence that has the power to kill has the same power to prosper. If you remember, there's a story about the Ark of the Covenant. There was a box behind that veil and the presence of God would dwell on top of that that Ark. And there was a man named Uzzah. You remember when they were like carrying the Ark back to Jerusalem and this man named Uzzah accidentally put his hand on the Ark and then was zapped and became a Wuzzah? He was gone. He was a goner after that. He literally dropped dead. And David was so, his heart was so stricken because he, he was like, he, at one point they were celebrating and another point, Uzzah's just dead on the ground because of the holiness of God. So what they do, they're like, yo, this thing's cursed. No, it's not cursed. It's holy. And then so what they do is they leave it in this place called Obed-Edom and the household of Obed-Edom was blessed because of the presence of the Ark of the Covenant there. This thing is not a toy. And so for so long, here's what's amazing about you and I, when we could so casually walk into church, if I, can be, if I can be honest, what we get to walk into as new covenant believers is something that these people, the people of God, have been crying out for for thousands of years to be able to access the unlimited supply of God without fear. And it gets even better because here's what, it's, check this out. Look at what the Bible says. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. You might not see it on the screen, so I want you to write this down, please. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. It says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Guys, if I'm completely honest, one of the reasons why this message was very difficult for me to put together is because 
I, I want to give something like super practical, like, hey, here's the three, three steps to like accomplish to receive this blessing, or here's, here's four things you need to know. But as I'm going through this text, I'm wrestling with God. I'm like, Lord, what, what do we do with this? And he's saying, this is not something to be practically applied. This is something to be caught. This is a revelation to be caught. I want you guys to lean. I want you guys to catch this today. Because if you catch this, it will literally change everything. It will change everything about your relationship with God. It will change everything about how you witness to the people at your workplace. It will change everything if you and I catch this. So check this out. So Jesus, he dies on the cross. We're very, we're, we are very familiar with the shedding of blood being the remission of our sins, right? Because innocent blood was shed, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is the lamb of God. What does that mean? It means he was the sacrifice for your sin and for my sin. So in the old covenant, what they do? They sacrificed these lambs and these bulls. They sprinkled all of the blood all over the tabernacle so that God's presence could enter into that place and only one person could have access. But here's what Jesus Christ does on the cross for you and me as our great high priest. Jesus is the sacrifice for you and for me, so that by faith in his finished work alone, that blood gets sprinkled on my body, making me a clean temple for his Holy Spirit to live inside. This is the best news ever. Do you understand what's happening here? God is not, all, is not just this distant deity on the throne judging every move that I make. No, God has made his throne my heart. He lives inside of my body. And if you call upon the name of Jesus, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Unlimited supply, unlimited access. Someone say, I have access. The Bible says this in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the surrendered life. It's not about me struggling. God, I hope and I'm pleasing you today. God, oh, this is, this is so hard. It's God, I'm yielding myself to you today. Holy Spirit, I'm utterly incapable of doing the work that you called me to. But thank God that I was never called to. I was called to yield. Holy Spirit, I give myself to you. Fill me afresh right now. Empower me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And what happens then is you live a very natural life supernaturally. I shared this story uh, many eons ago with a lot of you, but there's, I think there's enough new people here where I can share it again and it's fresh for a handful of you. I, did a, uh, I had the opportunity a few years ago to preach in a distant land called Finland. And when I was in Finland, I was uh, on my way back. We were preaching from church to church to church. And it was just a time of just like faith being built up in me. It was just a really special time. And on my way back, I was taking a flight back from Sweden back to the U.S. And I get stopped at the gate. They have this like extra security checkpoint um, at the TSA gate. And I was randomly selected, probably because I looked very intimidating. And they were like, I'm just kidding. I look like Sid the Sloth from Ice Age. I'm not a very in intimidating guy. <laughs> And they, they stop me at the gate and they say, <laughs> you guys are laughing a little too hard at that. <laughs> they stop me at the gate and they say, okay, you've been randomly selected for further screening. And I was like, okay, great. Well, hopefully I don't miss my flight. So I get in line and there's this tent. Like if you can imagine, there's like this tent kind of structure right here. And they were going to do the further screening inside of this tent. So I'm waiting in line and um, I, I turn to this guy behind me. He's a little bit of a overweight gentleman, and I say, hey, um, did you, they randomly select you too? And he said, no, I'm a type 1 diabetic. So I opted in because I have this insulin pack on, on my belly. And uh, I heard him say that, and I was like, cool. And uh, as soon as I turned around, the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, didn't I tell you to heal the sick? And I was like, you ever have those moments when like the Holy Spirit tells you to do something and you're just like not spiritual in that moment and you're just, you're just like, I just want to get on and like watch some movies on the plane. Like, oh. yes, Lord. Reluctantly. Check this out. Reluctantly. Yes, Lord. I turn around and I said, hey, can I ask you a crazy question? And he said, 
sure. And I said, if I told you that I believe God wanted to heal you in this moment, would you let me pray for you? And he said, well, he'd have to give me a completely new pancreas. <laughs> and I was like, well, God created the earth in seven days, so I'm sure he could build you a new pancreas right now if you wanna give it a shot. So it was actually six days, by the way. So he sticks, he sticks out his hand, I grab his hand, and I pray the most unsexy prayer you can imagine. <laughs> Father, I thank you that you love this guy, and I pray right now you would create a new pancreas in his body, and he would never need to depend on that pack to pump insulin ever again, in Jesus' name. Well, enjoy your flight. <laughs> So then I turn back around and I, I, uh, I'm like, this is awkward, okay. What am I gonna do? Just say like, yeah, rip out the pack. Let's see if it works. Like, I'm just, my faith wasn't quite that high yet. So, so I, uh, I just go into this tent and um, they do like, you know, now they have this machine where I'm sitting down, they have this machine that swabs your hands and then you, they put it in this computer to see like what kind of substances you might be carrying. And, um, and so I'm sitting down, they swab my hands, the guy puts it in this machine, and uh, all of a sudden he just like, he's like. <laughs> he's got all this like really concerned look on his face. He, he like calls over his manager, his manager comes over, looks over his shoulder, he's like. <laughs> They're, and I'm just like, what the Smurf is happening right now? And so the manager comes over to me and says, what were you in Finland doing again? And I said, I'm, I'm here for ministry. I work, for, I work with people. And he said, well, when we scanned your hands, this machine is telling us that you are completely covered with a military-grade explosive substance. Can I read you a verse? This is what it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive, this is Jesus speaking, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That word power in the Greek is the word dunamis, which is where we get the, Greek, we get the word dynamite from. So I'm in this moment and I'm like smiling, like my face is like, really? Like, like I mean, really? You're like, I, I, am, I am so shocked because in this moment, the Holy Spirit said to me, this is not a metaphor. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You and I, as temples of the Holy Spirit, we, it, this is gonna sound like super meta and like mystical, but hear me, hear me loud and clear. This is biblical. You and I are actually a portal between heaven and earth. There's a reality and a power in heaven that then become, that's manifest through our bodies because we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And here's what's wild. I didn't feel anything different. Sometimes we're like, we're coming to church and we're waiting for a Holy Spirit goosebump or waiting for like our, our electricity to go through our bodies. And by the way, that happens. And that's amazing. I've seen it happen. I've felt it. But what's so powerful is that it's the word of God. Faith in the word of God, which never returns void. which never passes away which is true all the time, same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It was simple, even reluctant faith in what Jesus was saying that made me a quote-unquote worthy conduit in that moment. God says, boom, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone who's yielded. I'm looking for someone who's willing to look like a fool. I'm, will, I'm looking for someone who's going to access what's readily available to them. I'm not talking about a Capital One lounge. I'm not talking about an all-you-eat buffet. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about access to El Shaddai, the God who is all-sufficient. I believe that as we're headed into this next season, there's a capacity that God is trying to rend in each and every one of us. I'm asking right now, is there, are there people in this auditorium who are hungry Hungry to stop going through the motions. Hungry for, no, I, I don't want to make excuses for why I don't see the miraculous happen in and through me. I want to carry this power. Let me tell you, the power of the Holy Spirit is not an accessory of the Christian faith. It is essential. Jesus told his disciples, do not leave this upper room until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Because I don't know if you turned on the news recently, but there's a war out there. There's a spiritual war out there. And it would be unkind 
of our God, of our Father, of our Commander-in-Chief, to send us into war without the power necessary to kick down the gates of hell and advance the kingdom of God. But how many of us are walking around with this, this power, not in the form of a card, but in the form of a word, and we haven't made the transaction on it? We haven't received what was, what's been readily available to us all along. I'm gonna invite you guys shortly in a moment. If there's hunger stirring up in anybody here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of do my altar call in two different ways right now. So I would like for you guys to be patient but be engaged. Because what I wanna do first is I wanna give an opportunity for those who have never received the gospel before to receive what Jesus, the, the first thing before you receive the Holy Spirit, you need to receive forgiveness. You need to receive the shedding of blood for your sin and for my sin in order to actually gain access to this power. But then as I finish praying for those who are receiving Christ for the first time, I'm gonna invite other people in here who've received Christ maybe a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, but have never been filled or just need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. And we're just gonna pray for God to do a fresh filling for every person here, whether you just got saved today or 10 years ago. And I believe that God's gonna do what only he can do. And it's, it's, not, it's not about me, but I believe that the foolishness of this message accompanied by his spirit will produce transformative results in someone in here today. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna invite you to your feet right now. Everybody, please, everybody to your feet. And I wanna give the opportunity for the person in this place. This message about Jesus' sacrifice is making more sense to you than it's ever made sense before. Maybe you're someone who has been a religious person for a while and you've, you've thought that in order to earn a relationship with God, it was dependent on your good works, it was dependent on you showing up to church or you showing up to small group. Let me tell you, this is, this is a severe word, but the Bible says that our righteous deeds are like filthy rags to this holy God. If you want to get even more graphic, filthy deeds is, or filthy rags as compared to like a used menstrual pad. That is what our self-righteousness looks like to God. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No, nobody is good. No, not one. We are all sinners standing before a holy God, rebelling against his laws day in and day out. We are worthy of the wrath of his punishment separation from God forever in a place called hell. Hell is real. Jesus talked about hell more than anybody else in the Bible. Why? Because he came to rescue them from hell. It would not be loving of me to not tell you about the reality of our condition and where it's taken us. Separation from God forever. It's not a metaphor. It's not a symbol. Hell is real where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and the fire never goes out. But Jesus Christ came down as the sacrifice for your sin and my sin, that he might receive the wrath of God upon himself. He died a death that you and I could never die, but deserve to. And on that cross, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He breathed his last breath. He, he released his spirit to God. And he said, Father, he said, I commit my spirit to you was put in a tomb for three days. And here's the good news. Let me tell you, this is why this is good news. Jesus Christ is not like Buddha. Jesus Christ is not like Muhammad. Jesus Christ is not like Confucius or Aristotle. Jesus Christ proved that he is the son of God by at the same way that he released his spirit to God. He picked himself back up out of the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he, and he says, this same spirit, this same spirit that holds eternal life, not just in the life to come, but now. You can experience abundant life now. You can access what's behind the veil now. If you simply come to me in faith, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. He died for you publicly, confess him publicly. Confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead and you will be saved. You will be forgiven. He will look at you as if you've never committed a sin before. He will make you white as snow. He will give you a future and a plan. He'll change your life in a moment, in a single moment. 
All he's looking for is surrender. Is there anybody here today who's never given their life to Jesus who's ready to make a surrendering decision to him? If that's you, I'm gonna invite you as the band plays to come forward. I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer. And for the rest of you, stick around because I got something for you too.